happened here? Why are other clearly modular there? Okay. okay. Please do the honors, Ashley. Let us. Uh, yeah, Sharon Auntie is going to do it. So, Sharon Auntie, go ahead. Yes, Auntie. Thank you. May it be your will, God, my God, and the God of my ancestors, that you guide my eyes with the light of your Torah and save me from stumbling and making mistakes. For God gives wisdom, and from God's mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Amen. 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 So today we are going to learn in honor of uh, or for the refuah shalema of uh, small Tinok is an infant, Yakira Shirli Bat Talia. Uh, may Hashem send her a quick recovery, Ruach uh, Refua Shalema in Hashemayim. Also, today is the Hashkava, uh, 30th of uh, our friend Abraham, the from Libraha, Abraham Tarkar. Uh, and we will be giving a Hashkava. I hope I remember, and if I don't, please remind me at the end of the uh, study. We will also study it in honor of Avner uh, Pingre's mom. Penina Eshet Yonathan Pinge, Ruhalana Kenaina de Ganilin. So let us begin. Parasha Shemini. Parasha Shemini is one of the, I, I think, in, in terms of understanding, by the time we finish Parasha Shemini, we'll understand what is the weight of Parasha Shemini to the whole story of, uh, of Am Israel and uh, the Exodus. Okay. So I would like somebody to. Uh, volunteer to read the summary quickly and then we'll get into the meat of it. David, you want Ashley, to read? Any volunteers? David? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll read. Thank you. Uh, Parashat, Parashat Shemini, Leviticus 9 1, 11 4 7. Begins by discussing the events which occurred on the eighth day, the day of the inauguration of the Mishkan, Tabernacle, after the seven day ordination service of the Kohani. On this day, Aaron and his sons are finally installed as Kohani priests in an elaborate service. Aaron and his sons. Follow Moses' instructions and offer sacrifices so that God will forgive the people. Aaron blesses the people, and the presence of God appears to all the people, and a fire descends miraculously to deliver the sacrifices on the altar. Seeing this, the entire nation shouted and fell on their faces. Aaron's son Nadab and Abihu took their pans and put fire in it and offer incense to God and are consumed by a divine fire. God forbids Moses, Aaron and his surviving sons, uh, surviving sons from mourning but commands the rest of the people to do so. Aaron is told that Kohanim should not drink alcohol before entering the sacred tabernacle and are further instructed to distinguish between the holy and unholy and to teach the children of Israel the laws of God. Laws of kosher foods are given to distinguish between pure and impure animals, birds, fish, fowl, and insects. Right. Thank you. And that, that, that is also a big part of the parasha. Two pages, in fact. But... Uh, we are going to focus on the first half, and in fact, it is a continuation of what we saw in Parashat Sav. Parashat Sav ended with Moshe Rabbeinu uh, sort of uh, consecrating the Kohanim, and they were supposed to stay in the tent inside the Mishkan for seven days. After the seven days are over, the 
Mishkan is in, inaugurated and the Kohanim are inaugurated, everything. And the Kohanim become Kohanim and the first day of the Mishkan is initiated on Parashat Shemini, the eighth day. So Shemini means the eighth. Eight is from the seven days of Miluim, of seven days that the that the Kohanim were set inside the uh, consecration. consecration tent. And the eighth day, this is what happened. And there was an unfortunate incident where Nadav and Abihu, two sons, two Kohanim, the sons of Aharon, perish because God gets angry that they brought an alien fire. That is what is mentioned. Uh, it is a very, very closed section. We really don't know what exactly Nadav and Abihu did wrong. We really don't know what was it that God was, I mean, expecting because they knew that Hashem's presence was supposed to descend on that day. But till Nadab and Abihu didn't do whatever they did, the presence of Hashem, the Shekhinah, did not descend. So something, something caused the Shekhinah not to, not to descend. And by the time it descended, it, it took away Nadab and Abihu. So it, it is a sort of a closed uh, story in our history. What, what went wrong on the most important day, the pinnacle of the Mishkan. They built the Mishkan for a year. They, they did whatever they did with all their hearts and all their soul. And then when they inaugurated the Mishkan, there was this disaster. So it is a, really a very, very uh, problematic event in our history. What sheds light on this event? And what is is that we want to, I mean, I am not so sure. I am learning these ideas from uh, Al Aleph Beta, uh, Rabbi Foreman, Rabbi David Foreman. And there are other Midrashim here and there that, that hint to it. But, but it is a very daring thing <laughs> that we will try and do. But let us look at the... Megillat Esther, the first chapter of Megillat Esther. Right? What happened in the, if I ask you this question offhand, what happened in the first chapter of Megillat Esther? Who would be able to tell me? We just read it two days ago, right? First chapter of Megillat Esther. Whoever is wanting to answer, please unmute yourselves. Uh, we joined in the festivities of Rabbi, uh, the King Ahasuerus. Right. The first chapter talks about the festivities of Ahasuerus. Right. There is a party. There is another party. In that party, the king wants, for whatever reason, to bring in Mashti. And Mashti refuses his, his queen. And then he... He sorts of punish Vashti and dethrones her. And that is the setting for Esther to be in position in the right place at the right time when they need help, right? That is the background. And that is why that event is mentioned. That is what we would think, right? Why is this partying and everything, what has that to do with anything, with the story of the story of Purim? It is just a background so that we will understand that Vashti needed to be dethroned. And there is this event that happened that Vashti was um, angered the king. And that's why there was now a vacuum for the queen to, for Esther to enter the enter stage, right? But the whole first chapter of Megillat Esther is really a... a a comment or a midrash on this last chapter of last chapter of Tzav and the events of Shemini. If we just look at it with with the right eyes, let's let's look at it. And I would like you all to. I'm going to just read this, and we will we will see some words over here which are hints that are going to give, give it to us that this is connected with what I'm saying, okay? It happened in the days of Hashverosh, 
that Akashvarosh who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Nubia. In those days, when Akashvarosh occupied the royal throne in the fortress Shushan, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all the officials and courtiers, the administration of Persia, Media, nobles, and the governors of the province in his service. For no fewer than 180 days, he displayed the vast riches of his kingdom and the splendid glory of his majesty. 130 day, uh, 180 days, that is how many months? Six months there, there is partying. So in short, this is what we spoke last year, I think. But what is really happening is the first superpower that came to power around the time when, when when uh, we had the judges and we had established a monarchy in Israel was Assyria. Very barbaric people. All the time they were at war. And we see that Assyrians come to make war with the Jewish kings, the uh, northern Israeli kings and the southern uh, Judahite kings. And time and again, either they are defeated or they, get, they, they, they win and the Jews get defeated. Assyria. After Assyria, there is Babylon. Babylon comes to power defeating Assyria. Assyria, uh, then, I mean, from the face of history, is vanished. Then we have Babylonian kings. Nebuchadnezzar was the king that destroyed the temple and destroyed the northern, northern kingdoms. Uh, there was an earlier king uh, before Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, uh, who destroyed the northern kingdoms, probably Assyrians, I think. And then we have the Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian kings who decided the southern temple, uh, southern Jerusalem uh, kingdom and the temple in Jerusalem. And then we have the Persian kings. The Persian king, Ahasuerus being the second of them after Cyrus. Xerxes is what in English is his right name. And the background over here is he wants to establish a kingdom in and this is not a kingdom. The word kingdom is wrong. He wants to establish an empire, 127 provinces. What? How does he do that? By showing them what power he has and what riches he has and what... what. This is his way of establishing his royalty so that they would like to see what a vassal king Although he is paying taxes, but he also benefits from the empire. So this is the first superpower or the third superpower, in fact, in, in the lines of superpower that these provincial kings want to attach themselves to. What is going to attract them to in a time when you don't have taxes and you don't have you don't have tele, uh, telephone and communications or satellites or whatever? How does the king control such a vast empire? It has all these kings, these empires, but those kings should want to be a part of the major empire, right? They want to be a vassal because they are going to benefit from it. What is going to give them that motivation is this banquet that he will show them how much might I have, how much money I have, how much power I have. And that is going to lure them basically, oh, tomorrow if another king wants to take my province, I will be able to get this backup from the empire, right? So that is what is happening over here. He is establishing his kingdom because now he has he has inherited it from another Persian king. But the first Persian king was sort of, you know, in between from from Babylon to Persia. But second Persian king is already now in in the position to establish himself. For no fewer than 180 days, he displayed the vast riches of his kingdom and the splendid glory of his majesty. At the end of the period, this period, the king gave a banquet for seven days in the court of the king's palace garden for all the people who lived in the fortress, Shushan, high and low alike. I'm going to come back to this verse, but let's go back. There were hanging of white cord, white cotton, blue, blue wool, caught, uh, caught up by the cords of fine linen, purple wool to silver rods and alabaster columns. And there were crouches of gold and silver on the pavement of marble, alabaster, mother of pearls and mosaics. 
royal wine was served in abundance as befits a king in golden beakers, beakers of varied designs. And the rule for the drinking was no restrictions. What kind of a rule is that? Because the rule sets a rule <laughs> that will be something that will limit something. There is no rule, no restriction. That is a conundrum. <laughs> no rules, right? For the king had given orders to every palace steward to comply with each man's wishes. In addition, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for women in the royal place. I'll come back to then again. On the seventh day, when the king was merry with wine, he ordered Memukhan, Bizeta, Harvona, Bikta, Abakta, Zetar, and Karkas, seven eunuchs in his attendance on King Ahashverosh, to bring Vashti before the king wearing a royal diadem to display her beauty to the peoples and the officials, for she was a beautiful woman. But Vashti refused to come to the king's command conveyed by the eunuchs. The king was greatly incensed and his fury burned with him. Then the king consulted the sages learned in procedure, for it was the royal practice to turn to all who were versed in the law and precedent. His closest advisors were Karshena, Shetev, Admata, Arshish, Meres, Narsena, Memukhan, seven ministers of Persia and Media who had access to the royal presence and occupied the first place in the kingdom. When yeah, shall be done? What shall be done? According to the law, to Queen Vashti for failing to obey the command of King Ashwaros conveyed by the eunuchs. Thereupon, Memukhan declared in the presence of the king and the ministers, Queen Vashti has committed an offense not only to, against your, your majesty, but also against all the officials and against all the peoples in all the provinces of King Ashwaros. For the queen's behavior will make all wives despise their husbands as they reflect that King Ashwaros himself ordered Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the ladies of Persia and media who have heard of the queen's behavior will cite it to all your majesty's officials and there will be no end of scorn and provocation. If it please your majesty, let the royal edict be issued by you and let it be written into your laws of Persia and media so that it cannot be abrogated that Vashti shall never enter the presence of King Ashwarosh and let your majesty bestow her royal state upon another who is more worthy than she. I think that's oh. Then will the judgment be uh, executed by your majesty sound throughout the realm, vast though it is, that all wives will treat their husbands with respect, high and low alike. The proposal was approved by the king and the ministers, and the king did as Memukhan proposed. Dispatched were sent, dispatches were sent to all the provinces of the king, to every province in his own script, and to every nation in his own language, and every man who wield authority in his home and speak the language of his own people. Okay, this is the story. Any connections with what we what we are studying? Anything you think is connected with with Parashat Shemini or the end of Tzav? Baruch Atta Adonai Dovim Adam Shehkonu Baruch. Amen. So, the reason we don't find it is because we read it in translation. One. Second thing is. Whoever learns to read the Megillah text, there has to basically for anybody who reads the Torah, has to learn to learn to by rote, by, 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 has to have it by heart. And when he is reading the Torah and then when he is reading the Megillah, that guy who has it by heart is going to find the connection. So for us, you and me both, who are not what we call a... a, a a reader of the Torah. Uh, what is the word for, for that? You know, somebody who reads from the... He's a, Jeremiah, what is the word for somebody who reads from the Torah? I forget it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Baal Kore. Ha, Baal Kore. Thank you. So, so a Baal Kore, a master reader, that is what it means. He, because he knows these both stories by rote, he can make the connections and we are going to try and do that because that is how the Torah, why, why the Torah was written without any vowels. So you had to have it by heart. And that is how the Torah sort of sheds light on each other. Intertextuality, that is how it is. So let me read, read to you from second last. Okay. I'm going to read some words that that, that are going to give us a hint. So the first word, first, when somebody reads that 
127 provinces from India to Nubia. Sheva ve esrim umea medina. That is a hint. Amen. To the life of Sarah, really. So one who reads from the Torah, he knows 127 is the life of Sarah. So there is a connect between this number and for whatever reason, there, the, there is a connection of number of provinces by fluke or by for a reason we don't know. We'll figure it out. In those days, King Akashur occupied the royal throne. Fine. Now let's come to the last line. U bim lot hayamim ha'ebne. An end of this period, which is the first 180 days period. Hayamim ha'ebne. Asa ha'melech lekol ha'am. The king did for the whole people. And in Saim Shushan, who are in Shushan Habira, from Bigadol Ad Katan, Mishte Shivat Yamim. So there are two things. There is a seven day period. And there is a word which says Bimloth, which we say at the end of the period. But Bimloth, when, when something, and how does Parashat Shemini start? Or. Uh, Or rather, before Parashat Shemini, let us go back. Wherever it starts with the seven day instructions, okay? I am. Uh, okay, so verse 33 is, verse 33 last week's Parashat Sab, chapter 8, is Umit petach ohel moed lot et seu shivat yamim ad yom meleot yeme miluim, miluechem. Ki shivat yamim yemale et yedechem. So there are two words, miluim, yom meluim. That is what it was called. Or, and here the word is bimloot. Shevaya means seven days over there, seven days over here. There is something happening over here. The Megillah is making a connect. The way it is written is using a word from the Torah, which is not necessarily a, a, a regularly used word. Bimloot hayamim. Because that is where verse 33 uses. And there is a seven day over here secondary seven day period end of the party over there and this is initially before the before the inauguration really which happened on the shemini on the eighth day you have a seven day days of miluin that is called days of miluin in in regular language so bimloot gives you the first hint that the uh, megila testers want to make a connect now you read these words hur karpas utechelet akuz so you will see a lot of words over there. Karpas, Kechelet, Argaman, Kesef, Zahav. Yeah, yeah. What are these words? Fine purple, fine linen, silver rods. Gold, silver, blue wool. Right? These are the same words that are used in the building of Mishkan. And we are reading these words again and again for already five parashiyot now. Right? They have been building the clothes of Aharon. And they were made from all these linen and gold and different ephod and uh, breastplate and headband and everything, right? And then you had the vessels in the Beth Hamidash. Kli Zahav, the Kli Melechem. So you see a echo 
of what was happening in the Beit Hamikdash, or the the initiation or the inauguration of the Beit Hamikdash and the uh, and the vessels of the Beit Hamikdash, somehow end up in this story. Right? Maybe this is just a coincidence, right? Because they were kings. This is for Hashem. You have you have the best. We'll come back to the drinking who had no restrictions. Because end of our story, we have restrictions on drinking when you enter the temple. And from there, the Hachamim learned that probably Nadav and Abihu entered drunk to give, give, give uh, the sacrifice, the fire, the incense. And because immediately after the Nadav Abihu story, what we have is, well, it's probably... Whatever, it doesn't matter, but that, it, it connects immediately. So the wine drinking is some of like a inverted connection, right? There is no restrictions over here. And there's a restrictions over there. Now, finally, what do we have? Queen Vashti also gave a blank banquet again on the seventh day. Beyom Hashevi'i Ketov Lev Amelech. He was happy with wine and he asked them to bring Vashti. What is the word over there? Why is he supposed to bring Vashti? He tovat marehi lehavi et Vashti hamalka lifne hamele keter malkut leharot haamim to show the people sarim et hayofia the beauty. He tovat marehi. Her beauty because she was beautiful. There is one more connection that I I may have probably missed. Uh, no, it is later maybe. Queen, Queen was the wearing the royal royal diadem. Royal the royal royal. Only the uh, that is the midrash. Okay. Wearing the royal. That is already reading into it, but that is true. That is what Judah is saying. Is he wanted her to bring bring her in the nude yeah. because so so beautiful that that's only what the, wearing the crown. only wearing the crown. <laughs> but because it says wearing the crown, so the midrash says that that is what his intention was, and that's why she said no. Uh, but the but the story itself is not not so provocative. It says wearing the royal crown, which means to. Bring her as the queen to show. Okay? But the words, Lehavi et Vashti, Hamalka, Lifne, Hamelech, the Keter Malchut, Leharot Haamim. That word, Leharot Haamim, has another echo. And the echo is in something unbelievable. I mean, there is a lot of difference between the two things, two ideas, but Leharot Haamim. And when you see over here, let me go back. Here, I'm missing one, one. Sorry about this. I thought I knew it by heart, but you see, I needed to practice a little bit. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to read this in Hebrew. The 
the, the thing is in, in the Tanakh, this thing is a little, um, after, we think that this this really happens after the bringing of uh, Nadav and Abihu, and that's what I was searching, but it is written before. And Aharon lifted his hands towards the people and blessed them, and he stepped down after offering the sin offering, and the burnt offering, and the offering of well-being. Moses and Aharon then went inside the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the presence of Lord appeared to all the people. So what happened is they went in and the Shekhinah had to come. The Shekhinah did not come. So simultaneously when they went in and the Shekhinah, the cloud of glory which was in front was not descending. That's when Nadav and Avihu simultaneously gave the, uh, gave the incense offering outside. And they, they get killed and then Aharon walks out. That is how the things happened. But the word that it says, Moshe el ohel moed, el ha'am, kevod adonai el kol ha'am. And the honor of God, or how does it translate over here, and presence of God appeared to all the people. Vayera. They saw Hashem's presence. So over here, what was his intention to bring Vashti? So that people will See, right? Ot is her beauty. So there, there is another connect over here that over there the Shekhinah descends and people see the Shekhinah's descent on the Mishkan. And here the intention of Akashvarosh was to gain honor by showing off Vashti. For whatever reason, Vashti is showing off what is the whole point of the descent of Hakadosh Baruch Hu's Shekhinah. In the what does it achieve? It brings honor. The people now can understand and relate that this is this is Hashem, right? Once you get that, that is the highest point of the whole avodah, right? Of the service, right? What is it supposed to achieve? Fear inside of the people, honor inside of people that they get attached to this whole business of being a Jew. Correct? By the descent of the Shekhinah, that was achieved. Over here, Hashverosh also wants to achieve the same thing. He wants to achieve that all these vassal kings who are having parting for the 187 days, right? They will achieve this honor. They will give Persia, its honor by looking at Vashti. That is what his intention. Why? Why is a little unclear? But again, there are midrashim which say Vashti came from the earlier stock. She was the granddaughter of uh, of the uh, Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar's granddaughter. She was from the royal lineage. That he showed that now she is my wife. She is, you know, serving me. <laughs> she is, she is, I get honor out of it. Because that lineage, Babylon, is now, uh, what is the word, you know? I am, I am the husband of that lineage. I, that is the honor that he was going to get. And that's why it was important for her to show, show her off. Right? That, that is a political stunt that he wanted to do. But the, Hamim want to relate it and he says, see, the political stunt he wanted to do, there is something similar that happened in the Mishkan. But in the Mishkan, something went wrong. And over here, uh, this is, it, again, it went wrong. Over here, Rashi didn't walk out, right? Over there, the, the Shekhinah also did not descend to some, for some period of time till uh, till the Nadav and Abihu did their thing. Okay. So there is that connect. Then you will see, then the kings consulted the sages, learned in procedure. Oh, oh before that, we will say, I'm reading the second line. But Queen refused to come at the king's command. 
אשר ביד הסריסים ויקצוף המלך. Now this word ויקצוף המלך, and king was angered, מאוד בחמתו בערה בו. And his חמתו, his fire, חם מזה סדלך. So, and the fury burnt inside of him. The heat burnt inside of him. The anger burnt inside of him. There is this burning connect also because how were Nadav and Abihu killed? A fire issued from, right? Fire issued from, from the Shekinah and that sort of, sort of consumed them. So there is this happening and then another connect. Uh, so what I may, I'm sure there are other, other smaller words over here that again shadow and echo this story. But in the bigger picture, what is the Midrash wanting to do? How are we doing on time? Okay. What is the Midrash's role? This, this Midrash, by using the same words, how is a party in Akash Veroshes Persia. Anyway, going to teach us anything about what what this event was in Shemini. So we found the connecting dots, right? What is the what is the bigger picture? Who would like to take a take a shot at it? There are other, I, I just remember, there are other points where, you know, Baharon is hesitant to eat the, the khatat, the sacrifice that he has given after his children are passed, they pass away. He says, would God like it that I would have done it? So over here also that liking is it to the king's liking. That same words are used when, when they gave him uh, advice about what to do with Vashti and he, he, his anger was sort of calmed. So it is the same language over there also in the story. We have, in fact, Moshe questions Aharon, why didn't you eat the meat? It was a hatat, you, it is your responsibility. You cannot observe laws of mourning inside the temple, which means that by default, that is what my dad learned and I'll share, share that with you. Am Israel, in principle, had a minhag that they didn't eat meat when they were mourning. That is how he said, I won't eat meat. Even when he was serving and he didn't, he was forbidden to uh, observe the laws of mourning, but he didn't eat meat. Aaron didn't eat meat that minute, uh, immediately after his children passed away. And he says, would it, been, would it have been right? And she is angered by not only Aaron, but his two children, other two children who are alive over there. And so um, Aaron defends them and says, would it, been, would it have been right in Hashem's eyes if I would have consumed the meat? And Moshe said, it is good in Moshe's eyes. That is what says. So again, it is good in Moshe's eyes. It is there, it is good in, but the, the things are convoluted over there. Something was good in Ahashverosh's eyes that he dispatched Vashti out of her position. But over here, it was because they did whatever they did. It is, it is fine. Moshe was fine with the fact that they, like Vashti did not listen, right? While these guys also did not listen, they ate the meat. But over there, Vashti was dispatched out of her position while over here they were they were still installed and it was good in Moshe's eyes. So it is, there is like this opposite connect, but there is a connect. So what is the first paragraph of Megillah Esther wanting to, by all these hints to the story, what is it trying to tell us? That is the story. Who would like to take a shot at it? Come on. You want to try? Jeremiah, David, all answers are right, you see. 
because whatever is going to, going to be inspired in your heart is going to be the light that Torah is going to shed to us. And you will come with answers which may be very different from I, what answers I will come, come up with. And we, we want all the answers. So everybody wants to make a connect and open yourselves up and put it. That is how Torah is learned. Put in the, put in the effort. Sharon auntie, Ashley, come on. What do you think could be the... We have to get a little more interactive, guys. Uh, just, this is Jeremiah. Yes, Jerry. Um, it is, we said that there was, uh, Sarah's age has been written there. And then there is also, um, fire of uh, Ahashverosh or the anger, the entire beginning of the book seems to be taking us uh, and relating the story to the mistake or whatever is happening by the Jewish people then because this time, the time was supposed to be uh, that the Jews were supposed to be in Eretz Israel planning, building the second Beth HaMikdash. At least in that direction, they were supposed to come back from exile. And instead of that, they are supporting and finding uh, peace with the king and trying to find a, a place to uh, feel comfortable with a uh, foreign land feeling of uh, being accepted by the foreign king, being invited by the foreign king that at least is a sign of uh, all the problems that are started and also 127 gives an idea of something Esther related to Sarah or Sarah's daughter which is now been put into place. So the beginning has started for uh, the God will take the Jewish people finally put him put them in position that is they are supposed to be in Israel. There has to be money for the Beth HaMikdash. Uh, right. So I think it's a good so, start. Jerma, so, so, fantastic. I think you are hitting on the on the on the head. Uh, let me just open up the package that Jerma is saying. See what happened historically at this event when when we had the uh, story of Megillah right? Tester. We have we have the Babylonian king's collapse, and there was a prophecy that came to Dave, uh, Daniel who said in 70 years, and even Jeremiah says in 70 years, the next king, this, this Babylonian empire will finish. And the next king will, and his name was Cyrus, the next king will give you permission to go and build. So the next king does give them permission to go and build. And immediately there is a group of people who start back to Israel to come and build. But there are some political issues happening over here. The, the Samaritans who are from the northern tribes over here who are really, according to the tradition, not the northern tribes, but there were other peoples who were brought by Assyrians over here because they just, one of their principles was they dismantled and displaced peoples from their land so that they won't have enough uh, power. Till you are connected with your land and with your, with your uh, country, then you have that patriotism burning in you. If you are not in your own country, what are you going to fight for? Right? So that was their principal ideology that they uprooted people. And they, so there was people who were uprooted from Edom or wherever, I don't remember, and they were brought to Israel. So Israeli people were uprooted and they were taken. That's how Daniel ended up in, in Babylon. Right? They were uprooted and they were they were taken over there. 
but that was the Babylonians doing it. But the Assyrians had done it beforehand in the northern people. And these people were worshipping their own idols as well as they had one more idol called uh, Hashem in their pantheon now. And these were the peoples who, as, as we know, they were, there was always competition between the southern temples, uh, southern temple of Jerusalem and the northern two temples of Dan, Dan and uh, Samaria. So these people were connected with that. They didn't want the Jerusalem temple to happen. So they sort of wrote letters to the King, King Cyrus and stopped the building of the temple. Now comes Ahasuerus. At this period in time, there is like they are in Dili Dali. They should have pushed and fought with politically to continue the building of the temple, but they didn't do that. They were just waiting. Only after Darius, Ahasuerus' son, really, they restart the whole process with Mordechai and Esther being there in a position of power after the story of Esther to re-establish that connection. But now here we have a permission granted from King Cyrus, but Jews not acting on it because of political pressures. Okay. And that's why Hashem punishes them with, with sort of wake up call to, to get, get them going. But what, that is what Jeremiah is saying that these people initially, this story is told that it's connected with the inauguration ceremony because there should have been an inauguration of the second temple in Israel. That inauguration, instead of happening, these guys were drinking unlimited wine or whatever and and trying to sort of uh, find good, uh, good uh, to be in good, good company with, with the Persian kings. That's not their business, right? So that is right. That is exactly the period in history when they should have been re-inaugurating the temple. Very nice. Again, the second connection that we will make the second connection with with uh, with Sarah, or I'll already tell you that Sarah. What was Sarah's name changed from Sarai to Sarah? What is she? Princess. Princess. My she princess. The, princess of the world. She is exactly. She became the princess of the world. Why? Which means what? You have a king, and you have. A princess and you have an empire which controls the whole world and you have the empress of the world right so sarah and her age represent empire at least in this story because it is 127 that represents empire and sarah is the princess she was from a single princess of a small province my princess she became the princess of the world that was her name change so esther is using that that energy, the Beracha of Sarah, of being the queen of, or the, the, the empress of the world, because it's an empire now. So that is the first hint that we want to take a look at this from that angle. The, uh, the bigger picture, let, let, let me... Instead of trying to see the Nadawa view story or whatever, the, big, the bigger picture is in when Hakadosh Baruch Hu's. See, we will go to a story in in uh, the Kings. There are judges, and the end of the period of judges, there is always a period of seventy years. The first judge goes seventy years. There, there is peace and calm and then there's again wars and again a lot of upheaval and Jews are losing their land and again another judge comes in power. This is happening because they didn't have a king. So finally they think maybe we should have a king like the other kings have, other peoples have and maybe that will sort this problem. So they come to they come to Samuel who is the prophet in his time, in that time and say establish a king. What is Samuel's reaction? Samuel's reaction is, what are you asking for? Are you guys gone out of your mind? Hashem is the king. We already have a king. You just have to, you know, align yourself with his, his kingship. And we are all okay. Why do you want a king? A king is going to make slaves from your children. He's going to take your daughters to wife. 
is going to give you taxes why do you want so much problems in life you have ashim aski but they are they are uh, insistent and ashim says okay if they want to king give a king fine and in fact in the torah there is a law which says that when everything is okay you have you have established a king for yourself then the king will not take a lot of horses nor take a lot of wives and so there are rules for kings already in the torah so fine but even though they had these rules but it, from shmuel's perspective it was not a good idea to have a king why so the sages say because they asked for a king not as a, a not as a servant of a people but they asked for a king as somebody to lord on the people because they said the king like the other other uh, nations so king we don't have a king as another nation we have a king who is a servant we have a king who has to sit with a sefer torah all the time he has to have a sefer torah with him all the time that is how a king is supposed to act in israel he has to be a talmid chacham he has to he has to listen to the kohen and to the advisors and, and to the sanhedrin before he passes any laws so you have to have a king who is who is secondary to the, the to hashem to the prophets but but that is what that never that did that happen in the history of us except for maybe david but even david nathan comes up and says whatever you are doing in your royal power you know you picked up this woman bachheva not right you counted these people not right the king was to some extent doing his thing but all the time he was getting reprimanded by the prophets and that is throughout later on the kings were totally not even uh, sadikim all the time there were some sadikim there were some reshaim everything was there in uh, amisa so coming back to our story this story this midrash that the Uh, Megillat Esther is putting light on. Is trying to say at a time when they should understand why the temple should be important. Is listen, you guys have got it all wrong. This is not the king that you should be, you know, uh, muscofying. This is not the king. There is a king who already established. There is a king that the Shekhinah descended. this king wants to establish himself by showing his wife off by <laughs> demeaning her making a object obje- objectifying her that that is a king you want or you want the real thing which is the shekhina which was there the descent of the shekhina over there was to symbolize that am israel and all the other nations are subservient to one god to hashem he is our creator and he is our emperor the the whole idea of uh, empire which had just come into their brains then the the uh, megillah tester is playing on it and saying what empire this there is only one empire hashem's empire and hashem's descent what we already did that uh, whatever 500 years ago and you you are now wanting to go and uh, have, have a party where this is established there is a seven day period over here which is nothing because what is the difference from there to here this is a seven day period where you initiated am israel human beings and made them holy this is a seven day period after the 180 days period of drinking and and demeaning demeaning oneself this is a seven day period where you want to bring all the holiness which was what they they were using they were using unfortunately the the uh, vessels vessels of the temple which were which were uh, what is the word sanctified these vessels were sanctified in the seven days that sanctification gave them a state where it was like they were from heaven they were they were something which was beyond us and what are you doing you are demeaning that these kings are using those vessels for their physical pleasures he needs power he needs to show off to 120 provinces that we are we are 
in a position to give you the backup that is needed and you should be our vassals and you should pay us taxes. But for that, what is he doing? He is bringing the heavens down, sort of. He is demeaning the, the uh, holy and making it profane, demeaning it. While our role is to take the physical and make it holy. And that is what the Quran did. And this is a play to show you that there, that's why the, they were drinking wine over there. Unlimited. The king made a rule, which is the biggest joke of all. To make a rule which says that you can drink as much as possible. How can you make a rule? Rule by principle means that you are, you are restricting something. You are orbiting something. You are making a framework for something. That is what the king's role is. Here the king is going against the whole idea of a rule. Right? Now, coming from there, we have... Coming from there, we understand that that they were, they were, they were, the problem with the problem with Nadav and Abihu was also because it says it was wine. To some extent, Nadav and Abihu thought, and this is their thought was not wrong. Nadav and Abihu either they bought uh, for the first time the Torah says they bought uh, foreign or alien fire. Or the Torah is talking about wine, was not which was not, yeah, whatever is alien fire, which was not commanded and wine, whatever. But their intentions were always holy. Their intention was to bring the Shekinah down. But because their intention was to, to some extent, aligned with what the intention of Akash Varosh was to bring Vashti so that people will that intent to some extent was problematic. You cannot demean Hashem. Yes, Hashem wanted to come so that he wanted to show you his. But they get impatient when Haron and Moshe walk inside and they are doing their thing and they, they know Hashem will decide when he will decide. Hashem cannot be forced what he wants to do. Because Nebuah is like that. He cannot be pushed he will decide if he wants to descend. He has told you that he will descend, so he will descend. But Nadav and Abihu's problem was that they wanted to somehow, you know, plug in, plug in and, and influence Hakadosh Baruch. That is already Abu Dazar. To think that I can influence, I will be that, I will be that is Hashem's name. Hashem said, I am totally free. I can be whatever I will decide. You can never know. That is his first definition. And they say, no, we will decide. We, you have told us you have to be here, so you have to be here. He says, no, no, no. I, even though I have told you, I will decide when I will come. You can't plug it in. You, can, you, cannot, you cannot force me inside, like Vashti is saying. You cannot force me to come. I am the queen. I am, I am from the Babylonian kingdoms. I, who, in fact, there is a Midrash, another Midrash, which... which uh, uh, the Gemara Rabbi Ab Abai brings. So Vashti says, tell that, that fellow that the son of my father's horse keepers. That was what Akashwar was. Because in the olden times, the kings were usurped. So Akashwar started his career as the son of the horse keeper. This is what is he asking me to come? Tell him the son of my father's horse keepers. Although he, she was his wife, but she was very insulting. The son of my father, according to this Midrash, that that uh, in my whatever in my uh, father's land he would he would not have it uh, had any uh, audience with me or something like that. So, so you see that the whole whole point of of this. This Midrash, the, the, the take of Megillat Esther on our story is to tell us that Nadav and Abihu were doing the same thing that Ahashver was wanted to do by bringing Vashti. And that is to force her down in, in the presence of everybody. And, I mean, 
forget the midrash that says that he wanted to bring in the nude in, in a time in a time in a time when women were covered in you know that this is persia these women were they, they didn't show themselves okay there was there was this burkha or whatever the parda veil right to show a queen is something that that is not to their senses to to what is the word it is not not the right thing to do and he wanted to do it so that he will get kabod out of it on or out of it it is the same thing that nadav and abihu wanted to do nadav and abihu wanted to bring in the shekina so we will get kabod we will be able to show that we are the so on one hand yes the whole story tells us that hashem is the king and his this, this whole pinnacle of the eighth day was that hashem descended like in this story something had to show the vassal kings that persia was in power similarly the the cloud to descend and the shekinah's descent was to show to the whole world that hashem is in power and hashem is the emp, emp, emperor of the empire that he has created and that is what was achieved but Nadav and Abihu misunderstood that. They thought it from their own angle. Oh, he had promised that he has to come, so he has to come. We'll do whatever is in our power to do it. So, however they do, did it, that intention was flawed, and that that's the intention that is connected with worst, because it is, he does doesn't come in. That that how that is how I think I should learn from there that we cannot manipulate God. however friendly he is and however much he wants to be our god we cannot manipulate but uh, is there you can yeah request to him right grant or not right you can't manipulate so that is what that is what the whole whole i believe uh, the take on it from from uh, megillah testeris any more ideas please I just, just two more. I just, I just add a comparisonical point. Pure, yeah, yeah. I just add a comparisonical point, like because Jermaine, Jermaine just uh, mentioned it. So the life of uh, Sarah and the beginning of the Megillah, it is like uh, it says like one twenty seven. One twenty seven, but it says like seven twenty and hundred. It doesn't say a hundred and twenty-seven. It says that it is seven years. It is broken up. It is broken up. It says seven years, twenty years, and hundred years for Sarah, and it says seven and twenty and hundred provinces, like hundred and twenty-seven provinces. Like you have to add it, but the literal uh, translation is seven, twenty, and hundred. So why does it say so? Because kabbalistically, it is connected with something. Kabbalistically, what is happening is like kabbalistic. Kabbalistically, every word. Is ten degrees down. So whatever is one year. So if you are in this world, if it is one year, to climb up a world higher, it becomes ten. If you go one one world higher, it becomes hundred. And if you go one world higher, the fourth world, it becomes thousand. So it is like it multiply like by ten, and it hints you that it is something which is higher higher in like it is going higher. You are consciousness is going higher in the world so when it says 7 it is something which is from one world when it says 20 it is something which is from a world which is higher than 7 and when it says 100 it is something which is one world higher than the 20 world so when you add it it should not come to 127 it should come to the total should come to 10 because 7 is from this world 20 is from the other world so it is 2 so it is 7 plus 2 is 9 9 and 100 is from one world higher so it is plus 1 so it comes to 10 and 10 describes 10 describes the kingdom of god and what is the kingdom of god like he created everything with the 10 sayings everything the world everything is created with the 10 sayings and he created at the 10 sephirot okay So what is ten sephirot? Ten sephirot, say sephirot, are the way God manipulates all the creation, all the four cre four worlds of four world are under control of God, and how He controls everything with this ten sephirot, and how this ten sephirot are working. It is thousand, 
it is 100, it is 10 and it is 1. And 1 is this word. So when it says 1, 27, it is hinting to you about the kingdom of God. It is hunting to you about Malkut. Malkut is what? This word. Therefore, Ashveros tells his queen to come wearing the crown, crown of Malkut. The, the crown symbolizes Malkut. Right? Yeah, crown, but it says okay. Keter Malkut. Right. The crown of Malkut, the crown of the kingdom. So it is symbolizing this. And what does it symbolize for Sarah? It symbolizes for Sarah that she, like, she is the mother of all the nations. She is the mother, she is the princess of the world. Why she is the princess of the world? Because she has completed her life. And what is her life? Her life is 127. 127 is like, she is in line with, like, all the 10 sephiroth, all the 10 kings, the four worlds, she has, uh, she is not only the mother of the mother of the children who are in this world, but she is mother of the children who are going to climb all the four worlds. So therefore, her life symbolizes 127. Like seven years, 20 years, and 100. Seven are the seven lower sephiroth. 20 are the upper two sephiroth, that is Kokma and Bina. And 100 is the sephiroth, which is Keter. So it becomes 10. Total is like... Uh, 127 is like the, uh, the normal uh, calculation, but Kabbalistical calculation is 10. Hope uh, some people will understand it who attend the Torah class, maybe Jarnaya Joshua understood it. Sure. So if Joshua wants to add something. No, no. Anyone, anyone else has more more ideas that can come from this, uh, this combination, this disconnect, please share. And I'm just searching for Ashkaba. Recording. You can you can put off the recording. We'll just make an Ashkaba. Put this up also.